Hello and welcome to this headliner on mathematical problem solving. My name is Dr Robert Whittaker and I'm a lecturer in mathematics at the University of East Anglia and here you can see our beautiful campus on the outskirts of Norwich. My job here at UEA involves a mix of teaching and research. I'm an applied mathematician with a background in fluid and solid mechanics. I've taught a range of different uh, modules in our mathematics degrees, and my research often involves applying mathematics to solve, solve problems um, from industry or from biology. So what are we going to cover in this headliner? Well, there are two parts, this pre-recorded video and also a live follow-up session. So in this video, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what mathematical problem solving means to me, give you some um, useful techniques that you can apply when you're doing problem solving yourself, and then look at how we can use those techniques on a couple of example problems. Finally, I'll set you a couple of problems to look at for homework, uh, which we'll then talk about in the live follow-up session. OK, so what is problem solving? Well, I think in its most general sense, it's all about applying things that you know, perhaps in new and different ways, in order to solve an unfamiliar problem. So something that you haven't seen before and can't immediately see how to solve. Where might you meet problems that need problem solving skills? Well, the, the sort of obvious answer is in recreational maths puzzles that you might get given. But you also might come across problems that need this in harder exam or coursework questions that you're doing at the moment, um, or you might go on to do if you do a maths degree. Also in mathematics research, it's all about problem solving. Here you set your own problems and then have to work out how you're going to solve them. And in both pure and applied maths, we end up using some of these problem solving skills in order to solve the problems that we want. But outside of mathematics, you will also need to use problem solving skills. The problems might not be the same, they might not be as mathematical, but the skills that you pick up in being able to break down a problem um, and critically analyse it will be useful across a wide range of disciplines and all over the place in life itself. Back to the mathematical side of things though, you'll often come across different types of problem. So some problems will need logical reasoning, some will be just straightforward solutions of mathematical equations. Um, others will involve counting different ways things can happen or coming up with an algorithm. And the techniques that you'll need will be slightly different uh, depending on the type of problem, but a lot of the sort of general rules uh, and approaches still apply. So let's look at a few of these general techniques. So first of all, it's really important to understand the problem that you're being asked to solve. And this includes understanding the meaning of keywords in the problem. So any sort of mathematical terms, you need to make sure you understand exactly what they mean. And also understanding the exact requirements of the problem. So what is it precisely that you're being asked to prove or show? Do you need to show that something holds for all integers n or just find an example where it holds for, for one particular integer? You also probably will need to be able to convert the problem between words, uh, diagrams and equations. So typically, if you're going to do something mathematically with the problem, um, you may well need equations to work with uh, and you'll need to be able to convert the problem as you're given it, which may well in just involve words into those equations. And diagrams can be really helpful um, to help you do this and also to help with the understanding of the problem itself. But be very careful with diagrams. Don't be misled by them. Just because something's true in the particular diagram that you've drawn doesn't mean it's true in general. So try to avoid special cases. For instance, if a problem is about a triangle, don't draw a diagram with a right angled triangle or an equilateral triangle in it because those might be special cases that behave differently. Uh, it's also really good to introduce notation. So if you've got some unknown quantity, then give it a symbol or a letter to represent that mathematically. And then you can put that symbol or letter into an equation, um, which will hopefully give you something that you can do some maths with. So for instance, if you've got an unknown side length, maybe call it L. If you're looking at the time something takes, maybe call it T, etc. OK, finally, for this slide, it can be really useful to recall um, any useful results or formulae that you know that you think might be relevant to the problem. And it can often be helpful to write these down. So um, just having them in front of you on a piece of paper may help you see some connections between some of the formulae and what you're trying to show. So, for instance, if you've got something with a quadratic equation, write down the quadratic equation formula, even if you're not sure whether you're, you're going to need it or not. Another load of techniques for you. So 
um, when you're looking at the problem, there may be some constraints or restrictions in the description. So you may get asked to prove that something works whenever n is greater than or equal to 5, or whenever n is even. And these constraints might well be, be very important. Um, so if you're proving something for n greater than or equal to 5, what's special about 5 that means that it's true then, but maybe not for n equals 4? And thinking about that might give you some insight into the problem that you're trying to prove. Try looking at the problem in different ways. So the first approach that you take might not always work, or if it does work, it might not be the easiest way uh, of tackling the problem. So try and look at the problem from different angles. Think about different ways of showing things, different interpretations of it. Also think about different methods of proof. So you'll probably have seen a few different methods of proof uh, in your A-levels so far, and you might come up uh, and see more different methods um, later on, and also if you go on to study maths in, in a degree. So think about all the different methods that you know and which of them might be appropriate for solving the, the problem that you're looking at. It's also good to consider some smaller or simpler cases first rather than track, tackling uh, a whole big problem. So for instance, if you're asked to prove that something works for, for any integer n, um, rather than going for the general solution to start with, think about some small n first. So maybe try n equals 1, n equals 2, see if you can get a handle on why those are true, and that might help you tackle the general problem. You might also be able to build up a solution recursively. So doing a general n, you might be able to break down your problem um, into, into smaller problems or the previous value of n. So if you can prove the one before and the one before that and the one before that, you could build up a whole, a whole solution. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, there's a, a very good proof technique called proof by induction uh, that you might come across, which uses this idea of starting at one n and going up and up and up in order to prove every n. Finally, um, if you're asked to prove that something is true, it can be really useful to try and construct a counterexample. So this is a specific example where the result fails. And obviously, if it's true, you won't be able to find a counterexample. But seeing why you can't find one may give you some useful insight into why it must be true. And using this approach may also lead you to a proof by contradiction. So this is where you assume the result is, is false. Um, make some deductions based on that uh, and then come to the conclusion that that can't possibly work and therefore the result must be true. Okay, so that's a, a set of eight techniques that you can try and use for, for mathematical problem solving. Let's now look at how we can apply them to a couple of example problems. So the first problem, you're asked to prove that the diagonals of a quadrilateral are perpendicular if and only if the sums of the squares of the lengths of each pair of opposite sides are equal. So here are the first four techniques that I told you about. Uh, if you'd like, you could pause the video now and think how these different four different techniques can be applied to this problem. And then I'll talk you through it in a moment. Okay, so first of all, understanding the problem. So there are a few key words here that you need to make sure you know. So first of all, we've got quadrilateral. That's just a, a four-sided polygon. So four straight lines uh, in a plane, enclosing a region. Uh, perpendicular, that means at right angles too. So the angle between the two diagonals needs to be 90 degrees here. And then finally, uh, a specific mathematical phrase that you'll meet a lot if you come and do a maths degree is if and only if. And what this is telling us is that we need to prove things in both directions. So we need to prove that if the sums of the squares are equal, then the diagonals will be perpendicular. And also, if the diagonals are perpendicular, then the sums of the squares will be equal. So that's two separate things we need to prove. And we might need to use a different technique or a different approach um, for each one. So just be aware that you've got two things to do and you may need different approaches. Okay, so the next thing was converting between words, diagrams and equations. Uh, and that's often coupled with introducing notation. So in this problem, uh, we're asked to do something with a quadrilateral. So let's draw uh, a quadrilateral. And I'm being careful here um, not to draw a special case. So not to draw a rectangle or a kite or a, a trapezium. Uh, but to keep it general. And we're also, we need to know something about the diagonals. So we'll put in the two diagonals, like so. 
Um, and we asked to sort of relate something to do with the lengths of the sides and the angle that the two diagonals make. So let's label all these. So we'll have four side lengths, A, B, C, and D, and we'll have an angle alpha between the two diagonals. And looking at this, we can see some triangles. Maybe we can do some trigonometry in them. And it might also be useful um, to have some additional lengths labeled. So maybe the lengths of the bits of the diagonals um, from each corner to the, to the crossing point might be useful. So we might label them P, Q, R, and S for different values. And we might want to label the corners of the quadrilateral as well. Uh, let's use capital letters for those, uh, like so. And then in terms of this diagram and the new notation, the problem then is to prove that the, the diagonals are perpendicular, so that's alpha being equal to 90, if and only if the sums of the squares of the lengths of each pair of opposite sides are equal. So that will be saying that a squared plus c squared, so that's the sum of, of two squares on opposite sides, um, is equal to b squared plus d squared, if and only if the angle alpha is equal to 90 degrees. So that's our problem then stated in a more mathematical way and we've converted the problem that was originally in words through a diagram to an equation. Okay so if I was presenting this result to someone I wouldn't just want to draw this and write down the equation I'd need some words to explain what's going on. Um, so here's an example of the sort of thing I might write to set up this diagram and introduce all the notation. And if you like, pause the video and have a read of this and see how I've explained things. Okay, so uh, the last technique was to, use, to, to recall some useful results or formulae. Um, so you can see from the diagram that we're dealing with triangles where we've got to sort of have some connection between a side length and an angle. And there are a couple of useful results that we, we know here that might help us. Uh, so if we've got a right angled triangle uh, and three sides like that, Pythagoras' theorem tells us that z squared, the, the square on the hypotenuse, is equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides. Um, but we don't necessarily have a right angled triangle here. So if we have a general triangle with an angle and three sides, then the cosine rule that you might recall tells us that z squared is x squared plus y squared minus 2xy cos theta. And these are some useful results and they are indeed useful in solving this problem, but I'll leave you to think about um, how you might complete the proof given this diagram, what we had to prove and the results I've got here. Okay, so on to the second example problem. Um, so here's the problem, um, and here are the second set of four techniques I told you. Uh, so again, if you want to pause the video um, and have a think about this for yourself, you can do, and then I'll talk you through it. So this problem says there's an odd number of people, uh, n greater than 1, stand in a field such that the distances between each pair of people are all different. Each person then watches the person closest to them, and you're asked to prove that at least one person is not being watched. So let's consider any constraints or restrictions in this description. So we're told there's an odd number of people. Um, why is that important? Well, it's not entirely clear, uh, although it turns out that this result isn't true if you've got an even number of people. We're also told that n is greater than 1, um, so why might that matter? Well, if we've got one person in the field, then there isn't anyone for them, them to look at, so the problem doesn't really make sense. Um, so probably that's why that constraint's there. And then we're also told that the distances between each pair of people are all different. Uh, why is that uh, useful or needed? Well, the next line says that each person watches the person closest to them. If some of the distances could be the same, then the, per the person closest to, to any individual might be the same distance away as another person and then it wouldn't be obvious which person they had to watch. So maybe that constraint is there just to make sure that there is a single closest person to them and then it's uh, unambiguous which person they have to be watching. Okay, the next bit, uh, next technique was to look at the problem in different ways. Uh, and one interesting observation that you can make here is because you've got n people, each watching one of another set of, of n people, if there's someone that's not being watched, because there are n people watching, and then at most n minus 1 being watched, that would mean that someone has to be being watched twice. 
And equally, if someone is being watched twice, then you can't have all n different people all being watched. So rather than proving that at least one person is not being watched, we could prove that at least one person is being watched twice, and that would be equivalent. So it gives us an alternative way of looking at this problem. OK, the next uh, technique was to consider some smaller or simpler cases first and see if that helps us. So here we've got an odd number greater than one of people. So the smallest odd number we can have is three. So what happens with three people? So three people, each a different distance apart, means that they'll form a triangle with all three sides being different lengths. And then we can see who watches who. Um, so this person will watch that one. This person will watch that one. And this person will watch that one. So we can see here um, that there's someone being watched twice and there's someone not being watched at all. And if you were careful with explaining this, this would be a proof for n equals 3. So that's fine for n equals 3, but we need to do all odd numbers. Um, so we then have to look at n equals 5. And I'll leave you to try that on your own, but things get a bit more complicated because there's all sorts of different possibilities for who's closest to who uh, and how things are arranged. So maybe this doesn't help us build up. Maybe it does. Uh, you'll have to think about that for yourself. The final technique was to try and construct a counterexample. So in this, we have exactly the same setup, but we're looking for an example of it where the result is false. So in this case, this would be that everyone is being watched uh, and everyone is being watched exactly once. So can we, can we look at trying to find a counterexample and see what happens? So if we pick a person, they've got to be watching someone and they've also got to be being watched by someone else. And there are two possibilities. Either those two people are the same person, in which case we get a little picture that looks like that, or they're different people, in which case we get a diagram that looks something like that. And then the two people at the ends here, uh, if we're in this case, they would have to be being watched and watching as well. So we could continue this diagram like so. And it looks like we could continue this indefinitely, but obviously we'll run out of people at some point. So somehow this point here is going to have to connect either to the end point over here or somewhere else on the chain. And what you need to do is think about, are either of those two possible? Uh, and it turns out neither of them are. And I'll leave you to, to think about that um, for yourselves. OK, so that was the end of our two examples, and hopefully you've got a little bit of an idea of how we can use some of these techniques now. So I'm now going to give you two additional problems for you to think about before the live session. So try applying those eight techniques to these problems and see if any of them help you. And then we'll talk about using the techniques and how you solve them in the live session. So first of all, we've got a problem called productive sum. And this says there's a finite sum of positive numbers equals 21. What is the largest possible product of all the terms in the sum? So, for example, we could make 21 with a sum that's 8 plus 10 plus 3. That equals 21. And then the product of the terms in the sum is uh, 8 times 10 times 3, which is equal to 240. So can you do better than that? What's the maximum product that you can get? And can you prove it? The second problem is called aeroplane seating, um, and I'll leave you to read and interpret that for yourselves. Uh, when you've done that, do have a think about both of these problems, and I'll look forward to seeing you later on in the live session.